So we, we kind of stopped here at this one and didn't get through it entirely. So I'm going to go back over it. What would a potential energy diagram look like? It was a three-step mechanism. Each step in the mechanism or each in the series has its own rate law, has its own activation energy. So what is it going to look like? It's going to have three hills. So a three-step will have three hills in it. Reviewing what's going on here, the reaction takes place in three steps. You notice this because of the three hills. The first activation energy, of course, here is, is not the largest of all three. So therefore, we would consider the first step to be a fast step. It has a lower activation energy than one of the other ones on here. So we would consider this not the rate determining step, the second step is the rate determining step. It has the highest of the activation energy of all three of the hills here. So therefore we know that this particular one, the middle step is the rate determining for this mechanism. The last uh, step with a, with a slight hill as well is also going to be considered fast because it doesn't have the highest amount of activation energy. It's a little bit lower. So this one would be considered a fast step as well. The second is the rate determining step or the slow step because it has the highest activation energy out of all three. Another thing to point out here is like, this is the activation energy of the first hill. When we get down here to this part, this is where the reactants start for the next step. So this is where you're gonna find your intermediates. They're gonna be present as a reactant here, getting ready to go to the next step. Also, you would find intermediates here as reactants for the third step that's going to occur in this particular mechanism. So intermediates are like, those are like the reactant lines where those begin in the next step of the series and so forth. The activated complexes, of course, are the top of the hill, the transition states, where you have your bonds breaking, bond forming, your intermediates and all of that being created um, in this part of the pathway to get to the overall products. Now reaction mechanism requirements. In order to determine that a mechanism is valid for um, a particular reaction, you have to make sure that this factor is true that these elementary steps give the overall balanced reaction when you cancel them down, like we did in Hess's law and with equilibrium where you had the steps and then you had to make sure that it cancels down to the overall reaction. Same concept here, but in order for the mechanism to be considered valid, it has to agree with the balanced equation. The other thing is too, that it must agree experimentally with the rate law. So if the rate law is determined and is written out for you and you have to evaluate a mechanism to see if it agrees, okay, so your mechanism and looking at the slow step, the rate determining step, um, and that determines and has the same rate law that was experimentally determined through the data, then it would also be considered valid or an actual uh, possible mechanism for the reaction. All right, so now it's gonna be your turn. Go ahead and take a moment to look at this two-step mechanism for an overall reaction. One, you're gonna find and look for the overall balanced reaction. You're gonna identify any intermediates and you're going to um, predict the rate law based off of the rate determining step here. So go ahead and take a moment to do all those three things for exercise two. Okay, so we have our two steps here. Looking basically in your two steps, you want to identify intermediates and catalysts because those are the ones that would cancel out and not be part of the overall reaction. So that's what we're looking at here. I can see there's CL here, there's CL there. That CL would be identified as an intermediate. Okay, so that would be here in this part 
identifying an intermediate because it is produced in the first step, the slow step, and then it is consumed in the subsequent step or the next step, the second step of the series. So it's going to cancel out and not appear in the overall bounce reaction. Now looking up here, there isn't really anything else that cancels. So just add up your reactants. There's two of those. There's two NO2s plus the Cl2. And then there's two of these ClNO2s. So this would be the overall balanced reaction here for A. So just cancel things down, come up with the overall balanced reaction. Now, in order to do the predicted rate law, we need to look at the slow step. Okay, the slow step is the first step, so this is the easier one to identify. When you look at the slow step, all you do is count the reactants and look at the reactants. We have NO2, we have Cl2. Both of them, there's only one of them, so they're both considered first order. So this would be rate equals K times NO2 and Cl2. Both are first order, there's only one of each in there. Now say it had uh, NO2 in the, in the reactant twice in the first step. If that were the case, then the NO2 would be a second order reactant because there would be two of them. So literally all you have to do when the slow step is the first step is count and identify the reactants. There's only one of them, then that is going to be first order. If there's two of them, that would be second order and so forth. I don't really ever see a mechanism where you're going to have a third order from the, the slow step being the first step. However, um, that's not a typical thing that you're going to see. Now we're going to talk and look at um, there's our answers. Very good. Mechanisms with the fast initial step. So this is the harder version of, of figuring out the rate law from the mechanism that when the slow step is not the first step. The rate determining step comes later on in the series in the mechanism. The elementary steps, it's one, it's either second or third. So basically what's going to happen in that case, your rate determining step, your RDS, is going to have, it may contain some intermediates in the, in the uh, reactants side of the step. Well, that's kind of a problem because you can't use those in the rate law. Previous step is a rapid is rapid and reaches equilibrium. The forward and reverse reaction rates are equal. So the concentrations of reactants and products of the step are related and the product is an intermediate. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at this like the first step or the step above is a fast equilibrium step. We're gonna analyze it and be able to eventually do some substituting. You're gonna have to substitute in so that we get just reactants. We don't have intermediates in there because this is what we want. We want just reactants. The substituting process is a little bit confusing, but once you, you know, talk through it conceptually, it makes sense. And when they have you do this, where the fast step uh, or is not, or the, fa the initial step or the first step is a fast step, rate determining step is either step two or step three. This is called a steady state approximation. Steady state approximation, where we have to do this substituting in to get rid of the intermediates. Now we're going to talk about and look, go through the next exercise together and explain how this works. All right, we have a reaction. A plus 2B gives us C. We have this proposed mechanism and we want to write the rate law for this mechanism. Does it agree with the overall balance reaction? Sure, because these Ds would cancel. The Ds are going to be considered intermediates here. You know, so the D is an intermediate. So we would add the two Bs together. Yes, you get that. And then there's the one A and then there's the one C. So it does it does actually agree with the overall balanced reaction, which is good. However, the slow step, rate determining step happens to be this one. So if we just write out the rate law from that, 
this is what it would be. Rate laws, K times the concentration of the D, because there's one of them, times the concentration of the B, because there's one of them. But we've already identified D as an intermediate, which we're not allowed to have in our overall rate law for the entire reaction. So we're going to have to do some substituting for our D here. Now let's think about a fast equilibrium system because we just talked about equilibrium. The rate of the forward reaction is equivalent and equal to the rate of the reverse reaction if we're talking equilibrium. So forward rate is going to be equal to the reverse rate, like so. That is a given value for equal systems at equilibrium, right? They have equal rates. Reactants making products at equal rates of products making reactants. That's by definition what an equilibrium system is. So we can write out the rate law for both of these because we have one going the forward direction and we have one going the reverse direction. So we're going to write both of those out. And I explain to you how I identify them, although like in the textbook, I'll also tell you how they identify uh, this here. So our forward reaction, we have the rate is equal to, I, I put it as K forward because it's the rate constant of the forward reaction. So our two reactants here are A and B. So the concentration of A times the concentration of B. So that's the, the forward one although my bracket's looking kind of funny, so let me fix that. A concentration of the B here. Now the reverse reaction, okay, we're gonna go the other direction now, where D would be considered, you know, the reactant if we're going the other way. That is gonna be the rate equals K reverse times the concentration of D. Like so, so that's our forward, that's our reverse, and here is our, you know, rate law for the second step. So we're gonna eventually use that later on. But what we know here, if the forward rate equals the reverse rate, this, of course, will, will be equivalent to this. So K forward, A, B, like this, should equal K reverse, like so. Now we can engage in isolating D so that we can substitute it later. So you, you know, divide by your KR here, like so. So now we have, you know, um, basically your D, concentration of D is equivalent to, oops, K forward, times the concentration of A times the concentration of B over K reverse. Now, I'm gonna just tell you in the textbook, the way they write it is they say um, K forward is K one and K reverse. I've seen it written like this where they do inverse of one. And then over here for this one, the second step, they make this K two. Okay, just so you know, because we're going to be combining them in a second. I like to put KF and K reverse because that helps me keep the equilibrium straight in my head. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take this part, because this now all equals D, concentration of D, and we're going to substitute it in here. We're going to put it in our rate law for D. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's substitute that in. So now we have the rate equals K2 uh, times KF over KR times the concentration of A times the concentration of B, okay? Um, and then, of course, we have to include the second part here, the B, so this is going to be multiplied by the concentration of B over here, so we're multiplying that too. Now we're going to simplify it down. Simplify it down. So we have K2, KF, KR. All of these are rate constants. So basically they're all just numerical values. 
We don't really care what the numerical values are because once you multiply the two on top, divide by the bottom, you're gonna get a new K, a new rate constant for the overall. So I change this over and I just think of it as K nu, like so. Because this is all gonna combine into one numerical value that becomes the new rate constant. Then you just add in your concentrations of your stuff. So the concentration of A, there's two Bs, so the B is going to be to the second order. And that equals your overall rate. Now you don't have to put new here. Eventually you would just rewrite it so it says rate equals K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B squared. And this would be your overall product. This is how you do the substitution. This is how you show your work for the substitution for the steady state approximation example where there's a fast equilibrium and the slow step is either the second or the third step, you do some, you know, uh, substituting in here to get the rate law. And that is the conceptual understanding behind it is that idea that the equilibrium, of course, the forward and the reverse rate are equal and that's how we can get into substituting for the D here. Are there any questions on the steady state approximation? Okay. So there we have it, our lovely answer. All right, let's talk about catalysts. Catalysts speed up the chemical reaction. We kind of already know that part. They are consumed in the rate determining step, regenerated in a subsequent step. All right, they increase the number of effective collisions. We want effective collisions because that means more will react. They provide a new or alternate pathway, pathway for the reaction. And those alternate pathways either orient the reactants more favorably, which would of course increase the reaction rate or they lower the activation energy various ways, mainly also by orienting them more favorably so that they can react and break bonds and form bonds on the correct side. So we have our catalysts here that do lots of different things. Don't forget that it's, you know, usually in the rate determining step and then it's generated at the end as a product so it cancels out of the overall balanced reaction. Now this graph shows you the one from Chem 1 where we would just show that we have the uncatalyzed pathway in purple. So this is the one, the higher activation energy. Okay, so this has the higher EA. The catalyzed pathway here in blue, of course that hill gets a lot smaller and your activation energy is a lot smaller. But as you know, if it only has one hill, it only has one elementary step in the mechanism. Most of the proposed mechanisms are going to be just one step. So this is just showing you a one step where the alternate pathway has only one step in the mechanism because there's only one hill in here. All right, as we saw before, if we were getting an alternate pathway where we had a mechanism with two steps, it would have two hills in there. If it had three steps, it would have three hills inside that catalyzed pathway. And the graph would look slightly different. Another thing to point out is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We are, should be familiar with these bell curves. We use the bell curve, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, when we're talking about gas laws and comparing the speed of different gases at the same temperature, and remember the more massive gases move slower and the smaller gases move faster at the same temperature to get that same average kinetic energy. But in kinetics, we're looking at it in terms of how many um, particles are engaging in the effective collisions or how many of them are meeting that activation energy. So as you can see in the uncatalyzed version over here, you have a very small fraction 
under here that are meeting that activation energy and uh, being able to react and break bonds, form bonds, and get, get the reaction going. The catalyzed pathway, as you can see, actually creates a lot more effective collisions. A lot more of the particles are in that activation energy threshold where they are able to do the effective collisions. So comparing the Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions for the catalyzed versus uncatalyzed, this one you might see like in a multiple choice question as well. So uh, catalyzing it and of course increasing temperature makes more of them move faster so more of them also meet the activation energy threshold. But you might see a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution with temperature as well, showing that at higher temperatures, more of them, you know, are able to do effective collision as well. This example is showing you the ozone. Ozone, of course, can uh, form oxygen in a very slow reaction up top. And there are two different uh, mechanisms shown here. The first one is this blue one. Mechanism without the catalyst, that's gonna be this blue line with the one hill because it only has one step in the mechanism. And it is considered very slow, very slow process for that to occur. Now, uh, looking at the other mechanism shown here with the red, okay, mechanism with, with the catalyst, shows you two steps in the mechanism, and you see there's the two hills, the alternate pathway, and as you can see, the activation energy is much lower. Uh, and what you want to see here is that the catalyst happens to be a, a like a free radical of chlorine here. Now, I don't know, some of you, you guys are pretty young, but back in the 80s and 90s where ozone depletion was a big deal, we always heard about it in the news and everything. But this is part of the reason why is because we were releasing the chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere. Those come from refrigerants and the aerosol cans and things like that. And they were acting as catalysts to break down our um, ozone layer up there in the stratosphere, which of course is what we need for the, you know, protection for the UV radiation. So this mechanism here obviously speeds it up and leads to the, the faster breakdown of the ozone layer. Now ozone's great when it's up in the stratosphere, like I said, it blocks UV radiation, helps prevent skin cancer, of course, but we don't really want ozone down here at our level because we, we don't want to breathe that in. It is very toxic to us, but so the two mechanisms here shown on the potential energy diagram, one without the catalyst, very slow is one elementary step. The one with the catalyst has two steps and um, is obviously a lot faster in terms of the reaction progress. And of course, that's why we did some environmental adjustments to some of those products. So we weren't releasing as much of that into the atmosphere or at least that's my understanding. It was a long time ago though when ozone depletion was a big concern. All right, let's talk about homogeneous catalysts versus heterogeneous catalysts. Homogeneous catalysts exist in the same phase. So if your reactants are liquids, the catalyst is a liquid. If your reactants are gases, the catalyst should be a gas and so forth. The reactant would exist in the same phase. Now the heterogeneous catalysts are the ones that are in different phase, obviously. And as you can tell in this nice diagram to the right, you can see this is a nice solid here on the bottom because it's all packed in, all the particles are packed in and they're sitting at the bottom. And then of course you have your reactant and product up here that are looking more like gases floating around in the part particulate model diagram. The heterogeneous one, Let's take a look here. Most often involves gaseous reactants being adsorbed. It's AD, adsorbed, new word, on the surface of a solid catalyst. Adsorption is the collection of one substance on the surface of another. So that's what that process is here. But this nice example here, the platinum catalyst surface here, because this is for catalytic converters, which are found in you know vehicles, cars. 
As you can see, the platinum catalyst is a way of having the oxygen react with very poisonous carbon monoxide. We want to get rid of carbon monoxide because it's very poisonous and, you know, don't want to be breathing that in. It does help convert it to a less toxic carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, though, and it provides its own set of, you know, things that, that uh, do wrong for climate change and things like that. But in terms of improving um, the pollution that we breathe in, carbon dioxide isn't toxic to us, but carbon monoxide is. So this is how um, the catalytic converters work. And this is, would be an example of the adsorption with the platinum catalyst or the solid catalyst. All right, biological catalysts. They do ask a few questions about enzymes sometimes. Most of you understand that there's, these are large molecules and they require catalysts to proceed at a reasonable rate. They're called enzymes, that's great. And actually, uh, for a lot of these reactions, the enzymes are very helpful to our bodies because these reactions can take place at a much lower temperature. So they don't need super high kinetic energy, super speed to make those collisions effective because of these biological enzymes, these catalysts inside our body. Now I'm sure you remember from bio, there's an active site and the substrate. So it's like the lock and key idea here. The uh, substrate fits into the active site. So the substrate's like the lock and the active site's like the key. And it goes in a two-step mechanism here, the fast one first, where the enzyme substrate meet and they, they just like fit together in the lock and key. And then of course, the second step is actually where the bond breaking or bond forming occurs. So depending upon this one, is, this example is showing you the breakdown of a substrate, but it could go the opposite direction too, where you have two substrates that are being linked together because you know a lot of the biological molecules, either you're building them and making them larger like the proteins, the nucleic acids and the lipids, or you're taking those big molecules and breaking them down into smaller monomers like the monosaccharides, disaccharides, the amino acids, the nucleotides, those kind of things. So here's a picture of the lock and key mechanism, of course, the enzyme and the substrate fitting there. Like I said, this one's showing a breakdown, breaking it up into two products from one larger molecule. But the opposite is true, like they could have those two reactants come into the substrate and then they get linked together in order to build molecules because our bodies build and replenish different structures too, like proteins, red blood cells, lots of stuff has to be regenerated all the time. This example is showing the breakdown of the disaccharide sucrose. Sucrose is table sugar. It's like what you put in your coffee or what you bake with. C12, H22, O11. Showing you that it's linked together here, bonded together, and it's actually the form of two monosaccharides, uh, glucose and fructose. It goes into the active site of the enzyme, which is sucrase. They, they name their enzymes ASE at the end. But what's gonna happen is that bond of course is going to break and you're going to get your two separate monosaccharides out of that. So this is, would be like the process of digestion where it's breaking it down into smaller pieces so it can get absorbed into your bloodstream and all of that good stuff. But once again, the slow step is going to be the bond breaking, bond forming. The fast step is just, you know, having the enzyme and the substrate like link up, the lock and key link up. 